Peter Welsh has been Vermont's congressional representative since 2007 and therefore has had a front row seat at the federal level on how Vermont and the nation as a whole have responded to the arrival of the COVID-19 virus. We had a chance to talk to him recently about how that response is going and what more needs to be done. So my view here is that the federal government has to be the financial backstop. It has to be the financial backstop for the individuals, for the, for the small businesses, and, and for the, the hospitals in, in, in the state. <clears throat> and, you know, I've always been a pay-as-you-go person. I think we should pay for things as we uh, spend. And I've been supportive of progressive taxes is one way to do it. But this is a whole new world we're in. And if we start quibbling about how we're going to pay for this <clears throat> in Don't Act, then the hole that we're going to go into will be much deeper. And what you're seeing at the federal level is, a, is an approach that uh, so far has been bipartisan and obviously very, very big, $2.2 trillion, as you mentioned. And then last week we did the $484 uh, billion dollar plan, and we're going to have to do more. Um, I guess one of the other questions that uh, you probably heard uh, – is will there will there be some more money made available to backfill state budgets that are getting the the assumptions that underlay them back in January are now in tatters? Uh, do you think Congress will uh, come up with a bipartisan approach <clears throat> how they'll be able to help states that are are struggling? Well, I do, and we have to. I mean, if we just let the states sink, then that pain is going to be pushed down to the property taxpayer. We're not going to have the support we need in fire, in police, in our schools, in our health care program, the Medicaid program, our, our three squares Vermont. So we'll have a major ongoing depression if the federal government fails to step up and help the states. You know, Governor Scott, I think, is doing a very good job in the responsibility that our governors have on making the healthcare decisions. You know, his stay safe, uh, the stay home, stay safe approach is right. But he's also pointed out that we've had a plunge in our revenues. It's like we're gonna come up 200 million short. Even at the same time, we've had an explosion in expenses. So we absolutely have to help the states. And the devastation that will occur and essential services, I'm talking about healthcare, fire, police, education of our kids, those, those will be devastating. And I, I believe very, very strongly that the approach we have to take in Washington, both on addressing the healthcare threat and the economic threat, is to err on the side of doing too much, not err on the side of doing too little. We can live with too much. If we do too much social distancing and the cases go down and slow us down a little bit more in the economy, we can get up for that. You know, people are living and we're healthy. If we put more into the economy uh, with these rescue packages and then a stimulus, I hope, um, we can deal with that much better than we can a, 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 a depression that it, it starts to happen when you get deflation and there's signs of that. Uh, and people not being able uh, uh, to basically make ends meet. Now, we're very fortunate that interest rates are so low uh, because the borrowing is going to uh, be, be at a much lower expense rate. But uh, we, we have to go big. That, that's really the heart of what I believe will abate or diminish the, the pain. Um, Senator Mitch McConnell has uh, suggested that maybe one course that states could take would be to uh, go through bankruptcy court uh, as one way out. What's the problem with that from your point of view? Well, first of all, bankruptcy isn't a tool that's available to the states. I mean, you know, he's writing up new bankruptcy law as we go. Second, what he's claiming is that he wants to do that because it, 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 it helping the states is he, as he puts it a blue state bailout um, and it's, it's really pretty outrageous uh, because Kentucky actually gets much more federal money coming into the state than 
tax revenues from Kentucky that go to the federal treasury. Uh, so it's essentially, he's been the taker state, not the maker state. Uh, and it's a pretty cynical response by him. And he's now expressing concern about the deficit. And of course, this is the same Mitch McConnell who is bragging about that $2.3 trillion tax cut. That's what it cost us. That's added debt uh, that went to the wealthiest corporations uh, that used it largely to buy back stock, not reinvest, um, and to very wealthy Americans. So um, it's, it, it's a pretty cynical uh, approach. You know, Mitch McConnell to the states dropped dead. That's more or less what it is. Yeah. He's starting to back off on that because this problem we have is not a Republican Democratic problem. And the cause of this is not like it's within any, anybody's control. It's a pandemic, and that has consequences to threaten the health and safety and the economic vitality of our entire country. In my view, this is a time where we have to all be in it together because everything you do for social distancing helps you, but it helps me. Everything we do to help your state or your small business helps the next door small business. Uh, a big issue that seems to be um, mentioned a lot in connection both with the uh, healthcare side of this and the economic side is the availability of test kits and testing to determine who, who has been infected and, and who hasn't and, and so forth. Uh, that seems to have been an ongoing problem ever since this began a couple of months ago. Is the picture brightening at all around that? Is there is there a sense that, you know, hey, we've got to find the money to Get the, well, the, the test gear out there. That's a really, really important point. And, and this is where I am going to get crit critical of the Trump administration. Everybody in public health knows that in order to get on top of the virus, you have to have extensive testing. Extensive. And the purpose of that testing is to then do two things. One, identify a person who's positive. And then number two, to do contact tracing. So if I test positive, the question to me is, who have you seen in the last three or four days? And then the public health folks call those people up and test them. And then you, the next step is you have to quarantine those of us who test positive. That's the way it's been successful in Germany. It's been successful in Singapore and South Korea. Now, on the test, we can't be having every state try to figure out what is the right test to give. You know, we don't want 50 different tests. We want one test. And in Germany, what they did is the responsibility for coming up with that test and getting the equipment. That was accepted as a federal function. The central government in Germany did that. What President Trump is saying is let the states do it. The governors can do it. That is absolutely crazy, okay? We can't have 50 states. We can't, I mean, Governor Scott has got things on his mind, right? He's not gonna come up with a test. That's not his job. So there's been an abdication by President Trump of the role that the federal government has to play. That's what's disturbing to me because it's essential as we start to loosen these social distancing guidelines that we have testing, we have contact tracing, and we have quarantine capacity. Now the funds are there. Congress on a bipartisan basis put money into testing. But we can't, you know, we, so we can legislate and authorize money, but the president has got to accept the burden of the leadership, even if it's at the risk of criticism. He's got to do this job. There's an awful lot of uh, concern about the, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, the PPP that came out in the first round, they're uh, part of that 2.2 trillion where some of the money that was supposed to go to small businesses instead of wound up in the pockets of larger corporations. Have there been safeguards built into the, the next round to there's, ignore that the money goes where it's supposed to be going? Uh, well, there's been two complaints about the PPP. One is the one you just mentioned, you know, Shake Shack, Ruth, Ruth Chris Steakhouse, uh, these big chains got a lot of money, and in the second round, we put safeguards in so that those companies can't get it. And it, we hope much more will go to 
the small business down the street that, for which it was intended. Uh, and Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin is calling on those companies to return the, the money some have, others haven't. So uh, this was done very quickly. Uh, we had to get the money out the door and the SBA guidelines were on the fly as well. So that is a problem, which I hope we have corrected in the second round. The other issue, it's not as big a problem in Vermont, by the way. In Vermont, we've had like 7,000 companies got access to the money. We've kept about a billion dollars in our economy, and it's not the big companies. It's really a lot of our smaller companies. But the second thing is that the rules that apply to those who do get the um, payroll protection plan, they're too restrictive. They've got to do it like from the moment they uh, accept the funds. In, in the real world that many of our businesses are facing, they can't just bring all their workers back because they're not having all their customers come back, especially like restaurants. So it's going to be a go slow situation for them where when they do open, they may only be able to uh, have half as many seats as they had before and maybe no bar. So they can't have work for all those employees. So we need a little more flexibility. And my hope is that in future legislation, we make it flexible to meet the real world needs of our small businesses that have taken advantage or want to take advantage of that PPP program. For the GNAT TV News Project, I'm Andrew McKeever.